So, okay, uh, we're looking at Song of Solomon. Um, things get real awkward next week. <laughs> and uh, so we're just going to have to plow through, huh? <laughs> okay, uh, the outline just do it. That's, what you want to That's when I want you to bring Grandma and my mom and, uh, you know, just everybody. Uh if people who are easily offended by everything, bring some of them too. Uh, so the outline again, uh, the courtship, dating, or engagement period, um, they're at the beginning, the wedding period, uh, and then married life afterwards. Uh, okay, so, oh, and then the conclusion. So one thing that I want to kind of bring out about Song of Solomon is it has this build in it that I think is important to note. And I think that this uh, chart really does a great point Um so it's got this triangle, okay? Here at the bottom would be like, um, you, this is someone you barely know, so there's really no romantic involvement. Right. <laughs> and this is like a uh, married relationship, okay? So here, here's what this is, okay? <sighs> okay, so on this side is commitment. Uh -huh. On this side is passion. Right. Okay? The bottom, <laughs> I, I, I laugh at the words that they chose for this. Fatuous love, passion plus commitment. Wow. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> so if you have here on this point of the triangle, yeah. this is intimacy. Right. Okay. Here you have passion and here you have commitment. The more uh, passion you have, it should be matched by your commitment. If all you have, okay, is commitment with no passion, you have companion. There's, there's, there's really no spark to that. If all you have is passion with no commitment, uh, you know, that's just not really a great idea. The problem is, is a lot of times what we do is we go real high on this side of the triangle where we have a real handsy on, touchy, let's have sex, and then there's no commitment. So then obviously what happens is, boop, they break up and there's heartbreak. The idea is that um, as the love grows, the commitment should grow, and as the commitment grows, then, okay, the passion grows with the commitment, and you get to intimacy, okay? Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, um, this chart is a little bit confusing, so uh, if you don't really get what I'm saying, just I'm just going to leave it, and you can uh, go back on online afterwards and, and watch it. But the idea here is that, you know, these, these two sides here, romantic love, companion love, intimacy. You know, you can't have a bunch of feelings with no commitment. You can't have a bunch of commitment with no feelings. It's just not great. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So if you look, there's actually a little bit of a breakdown here. Intimacy plus passion, intimacy plus commitment, passion plus commitment. So actually right here, uh, right here, infatuation, passion alone. Commitment, empty love. Okay, so I actually, um, this one was slightly different than the one that I thought I put on. Sorry about that. Okay, so these corners, I'm sorry, this is not the same one that I meant to grab. Um, it still has the same thing, it just says it in a different way. Um, so, okay, let me rewind. Uh, here, this corner here, this is passion. And he says here, infatuation, passion alone. There's no commitment. It's just passion. Right. Uh, this would be like a one-night stand. Okay. Then over here, this is commitment. But ultimately, that's all it is. It's just commitment. You're committed to a person, but you're not really in love with them. You know, there's just, there's just commitment. Like, for instance, uh, this could be maybe, uh, think of it more like uh, two soldiers. They're committed to having each other's back, but there's really nothing going on there. I mean, that's probably a good, a good idea there. So then you have, what if there's commitment and passion, but really no intimacy? That's that's this right here. Okay. But let's say you have passion and you're intimate, the liking. Okay. You have this romantic love, but ultimately it's not going to withstand because there's no commitment to it. Or you can have intimacy and commitment, which is called companionate love. Okay. But ultimately it, it lacks the passion that keeps love. Um, alive and then there's consummate love that is the heart of the triangle 
which on the other one I had, it was at the top of the triangle. That's why I got so confused just now, guys. Sorry about that. On this one, it's at the center of the triangle. That is the combination of intimacy with commitment and passion. Okay, so once again, if you're confused about what those things are, intimacy is liking, uh, and then passion is infatuation, and commitment is, um, oh, goodness sakes. It's hard to it's hard to 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 kind of get what he's saying. The difference between intimacy and and passion. Passion is like when you see someone and you're just like, wow, they're gorgeous. Okay. Intimacy is like um, intimacy differs from passion by intimacy being more about uh, the inside, uh, kind of like a, how your heart kind of connects with someone more naturally than uh, Somebody. someone else. I guess would kind of be a way of saying that. In, in the book of Song of Solomon, we, we see passion, but we also see commitment, and then we also see intimacy. We see the three of them combined. Now, I want you to kind of pretend like this is just a triangle, so I can show you what the other triangle that I meant to also include on here that I, that I didn't, evidently. Um, it had on this side was commitment, on this side was passion, and this side was, what was intimacy. And so the more you grew, the top of the triangle was the goal, instead of the middle of the triangle. The top of the triangle. So the more your commitment grows, the more passion can grow with it. And then that leads to intimacy. This one, it has intimacy as a separate entity from passion. And that's the thing I don't really like is it's it's hard to distinguish that line between passion and, and intimacy. So intimacy alone is liking, and passion alone is infatuation. But if you had to define the things by themselves, I don't know how you would define it by itself. Um, but anyways, and so the idea is that, is that you can't have a passionate um, relationship without having the commitment that joins it. And you really can't have commitment to something that you have no passion for. So you kind of want to see them grow together. Are you, are you wanting to say something? Yeah. Hopefully I, to bring a little bit of clarity to I this. I more kind of like a pyramid, like a three-sided pyramid. Mm -hmm. If you don't have all three sides, it kind of falls over. That's exactly this, this one. Yeah, no. Yeah, and I... The other one w was more like a tower. That's a that's a really good analogy. I really like that. I'm gonna steal that. Imagine three cards. cards. Imagine three cards, and the three cards are holding each other up by leaning into each other. Right. That would be this one. Right. The other one was like a tri like a like a like a tower. Okay. So think of it as Jenga. You're 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 stacking the bricks on top of each other, and that's building towards the goal of the tower. Right. But if you try and put like maybe the third row on without an adequate second row, it's going to fall on itself. That was the idea of, this, of the other triangle. Th that's a really good – thank you. Okay. For, yes, you, you bailed me out there. <laughs> Man, I was really having a hard time trying to figure out – now, I still don't know uh, exactly how I would describe the difference between intimacy and passion, though. Okay, let me try that differently. Passion, I like your body. Intimacy, I like your heart. Commitment, I got your back. Good? Yeah. Okay. All right. We're good. <laughs> now we can move on, guys. I have We have sufficiently nailed this to the ground. Um, a few things. Um, throughout the book of Song of Solomon, uh, you don't see them tripping over the small things. The small things like, my partner's messy. And that's kind of important because in marriage, the small things sometimes take center stage. And that's not how things were meant to be. And I think that Song of Solomon does us a great justice in showing how maybe you don't get so caught up on the little things. You know, um, be aware of someone's flaws when you're starting a relationship with them. Be aware of that. But at the same time, don't. catch don't the little foxes. And do what? Don't obsess about it. Right, yeah, right. Don't catch dwell, the little foxes. These little, it, yeah. these little critical things that, that, that you in your mind are tearing down your partner and your own relationship with, these little foxes, catch those little foxes. Catch yourself before you start crit crit criticizing everything. Um, okay. And then you also see throughout the Book of Song of Solomon people with imperfect characters. You know, the woman isn't your stereotypical perfect person. She has physical flaws. She has emotional flaws. The man, you know... We really don't have a whole lot about him except for her opinion of him, yeah. which I think is a world apart of what somebody actually is like. <laughs> for instance, your wife usually thinks that you're um, better than you are. <laughs> your kids often also tend to think, think that too. And so with that being said, you will never find Mr. Perfect 
or someone without flaws, but also be wise with who you get with. I think Song of Solomon contrasts very well with the book of Proverbs. They seen together, they give a real full picture. When you try and just read Song of Songs or you just read Proverbs, you get this mixed, warped image. But when you combine them to, together, you really get a, a fuller image. So then the next thing, you don't see them obsessing so much about body flaws or weight issues. Now, this is kind of important because in, in today's world, women are kind of led to believe that everything is dependent on their perfection to this standard like for instance okay if you want to be attractive you have to weigh this much and you have to have this makeup on so then the culture constantly tells these women this so then they do things to try and meet that like for instance spending all the husband's money to buy this expensive makeup because everybody tells them that they have to in order to be pretty and they see what i mean so it's like this vicious cycle that a woman gets caught into and i'm not blaming her we if you tell someone that they're ugly and they have to do this certain thing to be pretty well then they're probably going to do it <laughs> it's <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. You can't really take it, you know, like blame the woman for, no. for trying to meet this standard that you've put on her, you know. Um, were you trying to say something? Or? One of my dad's friends, uh, his girlfriend at the time. Okay. She's real into like heavy makeup and like real big jewelry and everything. Okay, so like They're... the Joker type. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> no. You, yeah. She really is. Anyway, she was trying to get my mom to wear makeup at a Christmas party one time. Uh -huh. And my dad's like, no. If I wanted to marry a clown, <laughs> I would have gone to the circus and found one. How does he feel about your your makeup on now? <laughs> he thinks it's funny. Awesome. Awesome. You know, and I think, it, I think that this is an important issue because sometimes even, even – okay, now let's look at the flip side of that. Men – look at things in a woman that they're told they're supposed to be the things that they're looking for. Like, for instance, the kids that are growing up nowadays, they get their idea of intimacy from the porn that they've watched. Their parents are not intimate with each other, or they are not there. So they don't know what an intimate relationship is, a stable intimate situation is supposed to look like. So all that they know is literally the porn videos that they watch. So they're expecting the standard from these women that they date and stuff that they're not actually able to meet because you know for instance they see this girl naked and right away they start saying oh she doesn't look as good as these porn stars see what i mean and so we're, we're expecting this false standard of, of, of beauty and anything that falls shy of that is deemed as unworthy or unattractive for instance it seems like it seems like women are less likely to have a stable relationship unless they aren't fat Guys are, 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 are convinced for the large part that they cannot be happy with an overweight weight woman. See what I mean? And that's not the case. I mean, for instance, you go to Africa and overweight weight women, that's that's like the idea of beauty. You know, and so it's just you have these complete opposite standards. You know, and obviously I'm not saying anything about weight loss or, or, or diets or anything like that. That's completely outside of my scope. But the idea here is that people usually aren't like they are in those images of perfection. People are usually going to have flaws. And in the book of Song of Solomon, much to my joy, they don't go on about – he doesn't go on and on and on about her, her weight. He doesn't even bring it up. He never once mentions her weight. Whether she's skinny or fat, we don't know. And I mean that's great because then you look at Proverbs, which I, once again I said that the two balance each other out. Proverbs doesn't say anything about a woman getting fat when she gets older. Proverbs doesn't say about anything about – a fat or, or or skinny whether that's attractive or not and i think sometimes we put these the, these ideas out there right. and you know well i have to in order to be happy i have to have the perfect house with the perfect wife and she has to exercise and you know do her pilates and all these different things you know and we have this idea of perfection and it's just like well maybe life real life is a lot more messy than that uh -huh. you know and song of solomon really does a great job at staying on point you know, at, for instance, when we get towards the end of the end of the book, you never once hear hear Solomon say, "Wow, you've really let yourself go." <laughs> In fact, w the part we're going to look at, I think it's next week. I think it's next week. He actually says the exact opposite. He says, "I love you just like I did when we first got married." You know, and just completely different than what we're told in this. It's just great. Okay, so we'll, we're going to look at that. But then also, choosing uh, marriage partners poorly can cause great problems from abuse to joyless marriage. Great problems.
Okay, those are just two the two sides of the spectrum there of what a, a bad marriage partner can lead to. A lot of times women will get with a guy that they think is just wonderful and then he turns out to be very abusive. Or, yeah, here's another example, um, it just becomes a joyless marriage. They're always at each other's throats. Maybe they got married for the wrong reasons or who can, you know, let me stop myself right there. Everybody gets married for the wrong reasons. They're just how much of the wrong reasons you got married for. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and that's just something where you have to literally learn to love your spouse after you say, I do. That's something that everybody has to do. And it's something that no matter how much you date the person or know the person, there's just going to be some things that you don't know until you are married. That's just how it is. I, I can't explain it. But anyways, um, but also you have to be willing to put in the work. There are some times when you will be doing all the work and your partner will be doing none of the work. And they'll, then there'll be other times when they're doing all the work. That's how real marriage is. People think that to have a marriage work, you have to have both people at, putting in 100%. That's just not true. To have a marriage that works, you have to have one person that's willing. That's what takes a marriage to work. So, uh, Proverbs talks about how uh, anger won't bring God's... You know, Proverbs talks a lot, of, a lot of things about how to deal with conflict in marriage. But the problem is men naturally filter everything that they hear to make it not apply to the women in their lives. I didn't notice that I did this until I was reading a marriage book. And then he was talking about this stuff, and I was like, oh, we do do that. Here's one example. Uh, Proverbs says that the, that the anger of man doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. Okay, so if you want your wife to, things to improve with your wife, should you get angry with her and start yelling at her? No, because it doesn't produce the right. See what I mean? Well, now, we as men, we overlook that because we naturally just filter it out. It can't possibly apply to my marriage. It can apply to anything else except for my marriage. Um, how far encouraging someone goes. It talks about that over and over again. Yet how quick are husbands to criticize and tear down their wives whenever they mess up rather than try to encourage them? See what I mean? It's like this. Husbands see themselves as coaches. We fix everything. We are fixers. Our, our, our wife has a problem. We can ex we can narrow it down to the solution. You should have done this, this, and this. Now you know. Let's move on. Women do not think like that. Women don't work like that. It doesn't work at all. So instead, Powers tells us about how great encouraging someone is. For instance, uh, you know, your, maybe your wife is, is not really listening to you. So instead of saying, boy, you're really not listening to me, you could just try to encourage them. See, and there's another thing that I didn't realize that is a major difference between, between men and women. Women look at the heart, and men look at the actions. Mm -hmm. Completely different mindset. Completely different. Keep that in mind as we're looking through Song of Solomon, and actually keep that in mind for the rest of your life too. Women, I think, have a more, a better way at looking at people. And I'll, the reason why I say better is because they're able to discern thoughts and emotions, and even though they might not know why they don't like what you did, they know that they don't like what you did. And I think that has great value because there are some times when men rush into things just because they, they're too cocky. They're like roosters, you know. And uh, if we would take the time to stop and learn from women, I think that we'd be a lot better off. You know what I mean? Because women have that way of looking at things. Okay, um, people rarely apply these the things from Proverbs to their marriage. Men usually overlook principles that apply to marriage and put minimal effort in while expecting maximum results from their marriage. <laughs> this is just a fact of life. Uh, I tell you this so in case you didn't, uh, decide to get married in the future or remarried. Okay, so that takes us to chapter 2. Uh, we ended last week where he was talking about – or she was talking about – well, once again, we, we decided we don't really know who's talking. But whoever's talking is talking about the foxes, catching the foxes. And we talked about how that could be um, guys – sexualized guys who just come in for a fling. We talked about how that could be problems that arise in the marriage. And tonight I brought, brought up the third option, which I only alluded to last week, the idea that it's your own criticisms, your own things that you bring in that, that tear down the, 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 the structure of the marriage um, and of the relationship, really, honestly. So then in uh, verse 16, the woman starts talking – regardless of whether, who is, whoever was talking in 15. My love is mine and I am his. He feeds among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn around, my love, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the divided mountains. So, <clears throat> believe it or not, but this um, this verse, <laughs> these two verses took me so long because there's, it's very unclear what she's saying. And so I have listed 
an option here, and then I have a, a whole roll of options in just a second, okay? So first off, notice that she says, my love is mine and I am his. That's, there's that mutual ownership. And if you know anything about what's called biblical theology, this is something called covenant theology, okay? The idea of um, a covenant of commitment. You see oftentimes God being the person who's making the commitment. Well, in this, it's it's a husband or a man and a woman. So you can see that they're progressing towards intimacy. Once again, imagine this, the triangle that I didn't have up, intimacy and commitment. I mean, passion and commitment. So their commitment is definitely there. Their passion is definitely there. They're working towards intimacy. They're, they're headed there. They're ready for that. Now, if it was the other triangle, the one that I actually did have, the, have, have it, think of they're working towards the center of that triangle. Now, something's holding them back, though, and that's marriage. Okay, so hold on. Uh, this also seems to imply monogamy, which is going to be funny because in a minute he's going to actually, or I think we're actually going to look at that next week, he's going to actually compare her to um, his harem, which is which is funny mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and ironic, but uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll look at that next week. But uh, a lot of things in the Bible imply monogamy while... Um, realizing that it wasn't a current reality kind of like anticipating the day when it would be a reality and i just think that that's really kind of cool how it does that it's called foreshadowing okay that's when something in one part uh prophesies when it will happen in a greater degree uh for instance uh there's a part in genesis where abraham uh gives a tithe to a person named melchizedek and this was foreshadowing uh well hebrews talks about that long story anyways um now, then she says here, um, he feeds among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn around, my love, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the divided mountains. Now, there's a few ways of looking at this. We're, I'm just going to read it from the CSB because that just makes it easier. But I highly encourage you to read it from the CSB, uh, NASB <coughs> and the ESV and maybe uh, the new NIV just to kind of get a fuller idea of what's going on. Um, he is like a gazelle with many pretty and pleasant things around him. Okay, so um, my love is mine. I mean, his he feeds among the lilies until the day. Um, until, so the idea here is like she's comparing him to him to a gazelle, and he's surrounded by all these pretty and pleasant things around him. So then she says in 17, turn around, my love, or uh, another way of saying that would be turn to me. In other words, he's not. So the idea here, as I'm understanding it is that he's got all these pretty things surrounding him, whether it's other women or, or, or just his palace or whatever, and she's trying to get his attention um, so that he spends some time with her. Um, it is important to note, though, that gazelles are active in the early morning and late afternoon. So this could be something where she's implying something sexual. Uh, I don't know. So, which brings us to the whole slew of other interpretations that we could get from this, okay? So that's my dumbed-down version. Here are the other options. You guys ready? <laughs> number one it could mean that he is away and that she misses him one of the translations talks about the hills of bathar or some nonsense um it could mean number two they are trying to be intimate but he must flee before being caught in other words this would be the motive of like young lovers who are um trying to fornicate and get yeah. caught yeah. uh he is surrounded by women and she's trying to get attention that's the third option um, in other words, maybe he's with his harem and she's trying to get him to spend time with her. Uh, he is intimate with many women. This comes back to the um, more directly to the harem. Um, or it's possible, once again, that he's just maybe around a lot of attractive women and she doesn't want him to be captivated by them. Like, for instance, um, he's walking around the city and she's like, uh-oh, that's, that's a pretty woman. Did you know that women get insanely jealous very easy? Did you guys know that? Did you women know that? Yeah. Uh, for instance, if you're in the same room as an attractive woman, she's automatically going to be jealous and defensive. This is just how she's programmed. This is a very good thing. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Because this is a little thing that God helped us men, another step that God put in women to make us as men more Christ-like. See? Because our natural tendency as a man is to be a rooster. <laughs> and we start scoping around for hens. Okay? <laughs> And God put this little jealousy twitch in a woman, which is a good thing, to keep us from doing something bad. Now, somehow, men were able to overwrite this jealousy uh, jealousy switch and have multiple wives. Now, how that escalated, I don't know. Genesis seems to imply that, the, that how men were able to get past a woman's jealousy 
was simply by power. In other words, they bullied them into it. Uh, which would make sense. I mean, it's not unlike a man to try and <laughs> bully his way into getting getting what he wants. I mean, that, that's actually what men do all the time. So, uh, okay. Uh, another uh, possibility of what 16 and 17 are talking about, maybe she's wanting to have sex with her or um, she's fantasizing about it, um, in which case it's also possible that she is the lilies. So he feeds among the lilies. He's enjoying her body. Um or uh, she's either wanting, or they are, or she's fantasizing about having sex all night, uh, and then he would flee in the morning. You know, once again, though, it's obvious that sex hasn't actually happened at this point, and I'll talk about how we know that in just a minute uh, next week. Uh, but uh, anyways, and then the last possible idea here is that she's simply saying that he's lovely to watch. Uh, so when she says, my love is mine and I'm his, he feeds among the lilies until the day breaks. In other words, she's just watching him. So uh, those are all the different options there. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you wade through them and figure it out because honestly, I worked on the on these two verses for hours, and I wanted to share some of my uh, aggravation with you guys. And now you guys get to go and wrestle with it and see what the heck you think he's talking about or she's talking about. Um, she, uh, she plays a stronger role during the engagement period, if you notice. Yeah. It isn't until the married life that he does he switches to the more dominant voice. Um. <coughs> <clears throat> which brings an interesting point. Women are generally better at keeping the love alive in relationships, whereas men are either too sex-oriented or too task-driven, which brings us to a final point that Song of Solomon kind of emphasizes. Sex for women isn't the same as it is for men. For men, sex is literally the act of, you know, insertion and then climax. For a woman, it's this whole thing of hugging and cuddling and, and kissing – for instance, for a woman, sex really begins days before and ends days after. And it's for that reason that men generally don't understand. <laughs> we had sex. Like, what's the issue here? Well, that is the issue. <laughs> that is the issue. You know, it, what, what, it, what you did days ago is compacting in this moment. You know, so that's why men a lot of times want to have, well, why is my wife not wanting to have sex with me? Well, because look over the past couple days and look at, you know, how you're treating her since you tried to negotiate sex. And is, are you telling her that you love her apart from the expectation of reward? Are you hugging her except for the expectation of reward? One thing you see in Song of Solomon is you see Solomon is interested in her. He's not interested in her for the sake of sex. He's interested in her. And I think that Song of Solomon is so often ignored um, as Christians that these very important little points – that it makes are completely overlooked because we'd rather just not read the book. These are actually really important points to make um, about marriage. You know, this was written thousands of years years ago. I mean, wow. There are some people who are just now as, as uh, counselors figuring this stuff out. So, uh, in my bed at night, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. I will arise now and go about the city. Through the streets and the plazas, I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. Verse 3, the guards who go about the city found me. I asked them, have you seen the one I love? I just passed them when I found the one I love. I held on to him and would not let him go until I brought him to my mother's house and to the chamber of the one who conceived me. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field. Do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. So this is the second time that she says that, which brings us to a very interesting uh, ending to, to this part in chapter 3, and I'll get to that in just a second. So the way this is worded in the Hebrew, instead of in my bed at night, it should be um, in my bed night after night. It's the way that it, the Hebrew implies. Uh, short story, uh, night is plural. So it would be literally more like in my bed at nights. So it carries the idea of in my bed night, night after night. So, okay. Uh, then uh, verse 2, I will arise now and go about the city. It seems like... Um, it's taught, some people think that this whole thing is a dream. Some people think that, well, a lot of different things. It seems to me like verse one was the dream. And then in verse two, she's actually woken from the dream. So the idea I think is that she's kind of having these sleepless nights. So because she can't get any sleep because she's lovesick, uh, she goes out to try to look for him, uh, in the middle of the night. Um, once again, there is the option, the, uh, the possibility that she dreamed about going, um, I think that has less warrant because it just seems like he's saying, or she's saying, that she went up to look because she just couldn't get any sleep anyways. 
Um, so think maybe the wee hours of the morning. Uh, so then down in verse 4, I had just passed them when I found the one I love. I held on to him and would not let him go until I brought him to my mother's house. The idea here is of clinging, um, grabbing hold of violently, like quickly grabbing, uh, um, wanting to, you know, make sure that he doesn't get away or whatever. Um, so she brought him home. The idea here has been suggested a few different options. Number one, to have sex. Number two, uh, she was fantasizing about doing this to bring him back to have sex if, if it was a dream. Or the third one, which I think is the more likely, she just wanted to be with him. The reason why I think that it, there was nothing that happened sexually is because she says, I brought him to my mother's house, which would imply that the mother and father were there. And I don't think they would have had sex with the parents there. You know, and so the, the mother's house seems to be more of an idea of safety, uh, a place of inviting him into her house to share in her life, not necessarily to have sex. Um See, when men read things, they instantly read sex and everything. But when women say things, they usually say things that sound maybe a little bit naive because they don't think like men. Um, so since her parents were in the house, there probably was no hanky-pinky. <laughs> um, it's talking about intimacy here either way, not passion. Uh, and so it's really hard to know how literally to take things in some contexts. So then in verse 5, she repeats this, Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you. Uh, not to stir up or awaken love. Now, in this context, that brings two obvious ideas. The first one is they did have sex, and it's spoken with regret. Now, this is very unlikely because, as we'll look at next week, it talks about her virginity on their wedding night. So I have a hard time believing that they had sex before the wedding night if they talk about virginity. and That just doesn't make sense. Right. Some people still see it there. I, I really think that we get into a problem once we get into the into the next chapter but whatever i'll just let you draw your own conclusions on that i guess um it seems like more spoken with the longing and desire in other words she had to once again they had to once again stop themselves from sexual activity um just because it was not the right time so then that takes us to the wet into the actual wedding itself and uh with that it comes in with the narrator um, who does the talking. Now, this is basically how this is going to go, okay? For the for the wedding, he will go to her house and then walk her back to his house. Then there will be a time of feasting, possibly a week long, possibly two and a half weeks long. Um, the consummation of the marriage, however, happens on the first night of the feasting. Okay? So after he walks her back to the house, they have the, the first initial sex there, okay? However, the family does continue the feasting and the partying throughout the next couple of days, okay? So when you think about the feasting period, it's not like our, where you go up to an altar, you do your vows, and then you celebrate, and then you go and usually pass out, but you intend to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, then, then the next day, everybody just goes about their business. That's not really the way they, they did it. Uh, especially in the Near East, they had a very uh, family-oriented lifestyle, um, so it was more of a group effort. Now, as far as the people checking the sheets to see if there was blood to make sure she was a virgin, that, as far as I can tell, had no basis in the ancient uh. world. I'm not talking about medieval world. I'm not talking about that at all. But this far back, it didn't have that basis. Um, so then that brings us to the idea, idea of veils, veils for the face. Okay. So women typically did not wear veils at this time. That was actually more of uh, something that happened after the rise of Islam. Okay, um, Judaism, for instance, really didn't have that big of an emphasis on covering the face and the hair and all that stuff. That's really an Islamic uh, thing. Um, obviously, there is exceptions, but generally that the, the rise of Islam is what caused that. So at this time, a woman did not wear a veil until she was going to the actual wedding process. For instance, the this part right here, she, she has a veil on. Uh, another example of this would be when Isaac, Isaac uh, goes to marry Rebecca, and the servant brings Rebecca back. She says, who's that out there in the field? And, this, and the servant says, that's Isaac. That's the guy you're going to be marrying. And so Rebecca responds by putting, uh, putting her veil on. In other words, we're going to go get married right now. That was the idea. So she puts on her veil. They go get married. And it says that he brought her into... Uh, the tent of his mother. The idea there would be that she that they were wed. That's the idea that they, that they were uh, from then on they were Isaac and Rebecca. Does that kind of make sense? 
so then the other reasons for wearing veils at this time, if I remember correctly, harlots, so whores, uh, widows, and maybe maybe someone else, but I can't remember. So that was the main idea for wearing a veil. So this is really the only part where it appears that she's wearing a veil, um, is in the marriage process itself. Who is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, scented with myrrh and frankincense from every fragrant powder uh, of the merchant? Look, Solomon's bed, surrounded by 60 warriors from the mighty men of Israel. All of them are skilled with swords. Now, now uh, this procession, these 60 warriors would have been uh, friends. They would have been uh, personal, personal friends. They weren't just soldiers. But they were also warriors, too. Um, all of them are skilled with swords and trained in warfare. Each has his sword at his side to guard against the terror of the night. Um, so just real quickly, um, he took the necessary precautions to, ins in to ensure her safety or her security. Either way, a response to her fears or possibly his own. Now, see, if you remember, um, she was afraid um, here in verse in chapter three. In my bed at night, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. I arose now, I rise now and go about the city. There's this idea of panic in her voice that she's somehow afraid of something. What she's afraid of, I really have no idea. Um, it could just be the draw of lovers, or once again, it could be the, that that panicky feeling that you get when you when you fall in love with someone. Like, oh no, are they okay? Because they didn't have texting back then. Uh, you know, so it, either as a response to her fears, which he knows about, or maybe even um, he's afraid, has similar fears of her getting wounded, um, he he makes sure that, that, that he takes the proper precautions. Another idea is that because he's riding up to her house to walk her back to his house, there's the idea of making sure that they don't get hurt along the way. Um, so men obviously should provide for their wives as much as they can. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that women can't work. I'm not saying that women can't have a life apart from the house. I'm not saying that women have to uh, raise children. I'm not saying any of those things. Uh, but men should do their best to provide uh, for their wives. Uh, which brings us to an interesting point uh, that I think is very obvious through all this. Men show love more with action than with words. For instance, in all this engagement period, how much more has she talked than him? Now, look what he has to say, though, which is actually said by another party. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, like Holmes of Smoke? Okay, this is his, this is his, his, um, his, what's it called, group, his, whatever word I'm looking for. Look, Solomon's bed, surrounded by 60 warriors, did it, all of them are skilled with swords, and then you get down here. King Solomon made a carriage, in verse 9, King Solomon made a carriage for himself with wood from, wood from Lebanon. He made this specially for them, just for this occasion. See, that's how he showed his love for her, with, with, with actions. Whereas women are more, you know, she's over there talking and talking and talking. He's more of just, look what I made for you. You know, it's just completely different. Um, so he apparently was fantasizing too, but because he saw her in everything. Okay, now let me kind of elaborate on this. Well, let's finish up three first. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, and its seat of purple. Its interior is inlaid with love, which I thought was funny because, funny because um, love really must not be very comfortable. <laughs> uh, by the young women of Jer that was a joke. By the young women of Jerusalem, go out, young women, um, go out, young women of Zion, and gaze at King Solomon wearing the crowns his mother's placed on him on the day of his wedding, the day of, of his heart's rejoicing. Um, and this is going to be repeated in the next chapter, except uh, instead of them gazing at King Solomon, they're going to be gazing at her. Um, but that's the next chapter. So then we get into chapter four. Really quick going through this stuff. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because this is where we're getting ready to end. Um, how beautiful you are, my darling. How very beautiful. This is, this is the, this is the wedding night. So leading up to sex. Next week we get to the awkward part in verse eight and onwards. So this, tonight we're, we're going to stop before the awkward part hits. The reason why I did that is so that way next week we can just plow through the awkwardness as fast as possible. And... <laughs> We'll be done. Okay? So, uh, how beautiful you are, my darling. How very beautiful behind your veil. Your eyes are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up from washing, each one bearing twins, and none has lost its young. Your lips are like a scarlet cord, and your mouth is lovely. Behind your veil, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David constructed in layers. A thousand shields are hung on it. All of them uh, shields of warriors, your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Until the days break and the shadows flee, I will make my way to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are absolutely beautiful, my darling. There is no imperfection in you. So just really quickly, it's obvious that he has been fantasizing this whole time. 
because if you look, he saw her in literally everything. He saw her in the Tower of David. Whoa. Uh, he saw her in sheep. He saw her in uh, in a cord of scarlet. He saw her everywhere he's looking, he's seeing her. So obviously he's lovesick too. Obviously he's fantasizing about her too. Being lovesick is not a woman thing. It's an emotion thing. Everybody feels emotions. The The church kind of went through this dark period where women were kind of, not women, emotions were kind of shunned. Men, to be manly meant to not have emotions, which is just stupid. But still, and so any man that was emotional in any sense was deemed as less manly. Um, and then scorned for, you know, he's gay. And it's like, well, no, actually he just has an emotion. Uh, which is funny because, you know, then at the same time, those same men were praised for having the emotion of anger. So that's really the only emotion that they had. No, no, three, they had three, three emotions. I'm hungry, I'm horny, I'm angry. The only things that men were allowed to feel. Uh, but they, they had to be horny in private. You know, they could make their, their wives have sex with them if they wanted to because they were the men of the house. So they could rape their wives and it was totally fine as long as they didn't say anything about it in public. Okay, all right. And then the hungry thing, well, the wife better take care of that because, well, that's just her job. And then, you know, then the angry thing, it's okay if a man loses his temper because why? <laughs> so, you know, in contrast to that, we read in the New Testament, Paul contradicts all of those ideas. Right. All of them. About being gentle. You know how many times Paul tells men not to lose their anger? Throughout the whole New Testament, it's repeated yeah. over and over again, but yet people just kind of ignore that. And uh, anyways... So, uh, so he's, he's seeing her in everything. Um, I already explained about the veil. Uh, it, she's no longer veiled later, which is kind of an important point in the next uh, section. Uh, but we'll skip past that for now. Um, now, in 4.7, it says, You are absolutely beautiful, my darling. There is no imperfection in you. The idea here is not about what she looks like. It's also not about what's inside of her heart. It's about how he sees her. In his eyes, she is flawless. That's infinitely better, I think, because he's not saying you are beautiful, and I'm recognizing that. He's saying I deem you as beautiful. In other words, she got her worth from his opinion of her. Now, see, that's a big statement. And also, I notice that women oftentimes do this, too. If you crit criticize them all the time, that is the image that they will have of themselves, because it's the image that you have of them. See, if you praise them all the time, that is the image that they will have of themselves because that's the image that you have of them. See what I mean? Oftentimes men like to criticize their wives and say, oh, well, she's just this, this, and this, and this. She nags me all the time. And it's like, well, maybe she nags you all the time because you never include her in your decisions. So there's like, there's this kind of male superiority thing where it's okay for men to mistreat women because we're the head of the house. And I'm really starting to have a problem with this. I've viewed it like that my whole life. And I'm starting to have a problem because it t tells us to act like Christ. It never once tells the wife to say that, I mean, to act like that. It tells the man to act like that. That changes everything. See, that means we need to be self-sacrificing. We need to be, in, Peter puts it like this in First Peter. He says, live with your wives in an understanding way. But what do men oftentimes say? We go behind our wives gossiping and then we say, oh, you just can't understand women. Well, maybe you just haven't tried. Women are, are women are fairly easy to understand if you're willing to put forth the time. Okay, so we have all this here, and we have Song of Solomon, and we have this guy who actually is making an effort to enjoy this woman, and there's nothing wrong with that. So uh, going through the things. Okay, so you're beautiful. Okay, your eyes are doves. Once again, this this it's kind of un unsure as to how he means this because he really doesn't clarify. Your eyes are doves because why? So um, we have the idea of maybe he's talking about her character being calm. Maybe he's talking about her being innocent. Maybe he's talking about her being uh, graceful. We really don't know. Uh, your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down Mount Gilead. Uh, there are some black, um, some black Palestine sh uh, 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 sheep or goats, I guess, which is probably what he's talking about. In other words, they look very graceful when they're walking together, uh, and they look very pretty. So in, in other words, he's comparing her with something that he sees in his day-to-day -day life. Um, that is very pretty to look at. Uh, your teeth are a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up from washing each one bearing twins. None of, okay, so commenting on her teeth. Um, 
this is something that oftentimes I think is kind of neglected. Women kind of do like to make sure that, you know, they're pleasing in every way. Um, your lips are like a scarlet cord. So the idea here is that they're, they're red and they accent her mouth. He says this, your mouth is lovely. Behind your veil, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. That's not very accurate. It's not brow. Uh, think more of your cheeks. Your cheeks are full. They're red. They're, they're sweet. They're succulent. Uh, maybe succulent is a bad word. Uh, your neck is like um, is like the Tower of David constructed in layers. This is not saying that she has a crane of a neck. That's not what it's saying at all. Your neck is like the Tower of David. It's graceful. It's graceful. Constructed in layers. A thousand shields are hung on it. All of them shield. So think of, he's not talking about literally shields on her neck. He's talking about the jewelry on her neck. He's likening her neck to the Tower of David and how it looks graceful. Um, okay, so, uh, your breasts are like two fawns. He's not calling her breast furry. <laughs> He's not saying that she has hairy boobies. He's not saying that at all. Okay, the idea here is more of, um, you know how, uh, kind of gross, but, um, you know how fawns kind of bounce when they, you get, yeah. what I'm, you get where I'm going with that. Um, another obvious implication here is more they are soft and, and, and graceful, um, in other words, he's not saying you have some big nasty boobies. <laughs> he's saying they're like fawns, and then he calls them here and elsewhere. I think it's here. Um, yeah, twins of a gazelle. They're both, you know, instead of saying and there's a little lopsided here, guys. Um, <laughs> that feed among the lilies until the, um until the day breaks and the shadows flee. I will make my way to the mountains of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. These are her breasts. The the that's her breasts. Um, you are absolutely beautiful, my darling. There is no imperfection in you. So then in verse 8, uh, which we're not going to read this week, but things start heading south, literally south. And uh, it gets very awkward, guys, very awkward. So next week our mission is to get through all the awkwardness as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible. But it's going to be difficult. So uh, anticipate that. Uh, if you want to bring uh, a veil to cover your redness, that's totally fine. Uh, if you want to uh, wear extra white makeup, that's totally fine. Totally fine. Like, for instance, not unlike what Nicole's got going on. Uh, you know, th that might be a good idea for next week, Nicole. Save that. Save that makeup. Uh, if you want to bring, like, maybe a Jason X mask, that's that's fine, too. Uh, are there any questions or comments before we close out? Please say no. I'm holding in a severe amount of pee. My bladder feels like it is about to explode. Good? Okay. Please tell me it stopped. Ah! Why is it?